sensual passion and then because these fixations are at times uh, how to say they they function um, as combinations as well now uh, so what is sensual passion then because whatever the images we see must satisfy our eyes whatever the sounds that we hear must satisfy our ears whatever the taste that uh, touches our palate must satisfy us food whatever the smell come come that uh, that our nose captures must satisfy our nose and whatever the tangible things that we touch with our skin must that is bring us satisfaction so subconsciously we maintain uh, that uh, the world must be a place must be something that brings us satisfaction that is our subconscious uh, wish when it doesn't happen we get frustrated with the world we get frustrated with our friends our family members our partners um so our our work uh, our co-workers consciously you may not know that but subconsciously uh we want the world to be a, a positive place a place a passionate place a place that always that brings us gratification satisfaction that's our belief that's our subconscious belief subconscious wish and that's when buddha says people most of the time people don't know what they want unenlightened people average people don't know what they want and then uh, so most of the time uh and most of them want um uh, multiple things now later on we will in in our future classes we will discuss uh, our wants and needs our attachments in that uh, class we will see how that uh, universally we only have few universal problems in our day to day life maybe 10 12 problems but if i ask you would say you have like 3000 problems but those are extensions um so uh, and then there are, there is no limit for our att- attachment there's no limit we have uh, limitless passion so unless we purposely choose what we want uh we would be running a marathon for life so that is when sensual passion so the buddha the buddhist psychology of sensual passion is based on the five sense faculties as i said i the eyes always want pleasant images and the nose wants perfume not the foul smell and then our tongue our palate would love to have sweet things not bitter things like medicine and then uh, so uh, and then uh, i we want to sit on a cozy chair couch uh, we want to throw ourselves in bed at night and uh, anything tangible to our skin must must bring us satisfaction that's what we want that is called sensual passion and then uh, so and it has different areas so that especially visual passion uh, visual sensuality visual sensuality is just like the car that i talked about you go to buy your car you go to dealership right and there are just one car that is more attractive than the other one but the other one is technologically more advanced but the car that you want to buy has a less a lesser number of options and then you would say you know what technology wise i like that car but it looks like a box it's not actually i don't like it um and then you would even put some blame on the design so that, that car had more options but why 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 did it and make it uh, more attractive and the more attractive car has lesser number of options but most of the time you would say you know what i love this car because it looks so good so cute when you say that word that's because of your sensual passion 
cuteness. Um, when I, I have noticed that in different uh, airports in different countries, passengers talk about the cuteness of the aircraft. They say that the aircraft is cute. I like its nose. I like its tail. That's all sensual passion. For the moment you want to satisfy your eyes, and then uh, when you are driven by lust, sexual feelings, and the other day you accuse you, you didn't like the presence of your partner because you say that the partner doesn't look doesn't look attractive like before. But when you have lustful feelings to that pa partner, you say you are the most beautiful in the world. That's what you would say. Why is that? That's because of sensual passion. So these are based on our, these are underlying fixations, these are dormant. These fixations are dormant. They function in our subconscious mind. And you wouldn't notice. At times you, you make some uh, sexist remarks about some person. But later on when the other part remains, why did you say that word? Because you, those are sexist remarks. Or it, did I really say that? Probably that person honest. He never, he never wanted to say those words. At times we only notice that we have sent something nasty only after someone reminds us. Quite spontaneous. Your response uh, to your visual passion and then uh, your response to what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, what you feel uh, is quite spontaneous. So it is the confirmation. Your verbal, your words confirm what's going on in your head. So, so sensual passion is uh, like the other one. This is subconscious. They are dormant. All these fixations are dormant. Second one, uh, resistance. Now, resistance is another fixation. You know what? Resistance is the most subtle form of anger. Now, for example, if you ask me the same question like 10 over times here, right, and you would see, I would try my best to smile. Meaning, now I am driven by, I am being uh, driven by uh, the fixation of resistance. Because resistance is a form of anger. That is the more subtle form of anger, resistance. So it comes from the root of anger. Now, uh, I have noticed that, you know, as a leader, as a, as a company or as a, someone uh, who uh, hold a, a command, a leadership in a company um, or, a, or an organization, uh, when you feel uneasy, you try to smile just to hide your resistance and smile according to Buddhist psychology is a clear indication of anger um, for example if you ask me the same question like 10 times the 10th time I would say wow oh, that's, that's wonderful I like that question but, but actually I hate that so that is then that's how that's how our resistance is. So the resistance has other meanings, but uh, we had to use this term strictly as a uh, Buddhist term here, Buddhist uh, psychology term, psychological term, resistance. Any questions about uh, resistance? Yes. So there are terms of confusion between resistance that you're talking about and resilience. Mm -hmm. That's, that's because of that I said that uh, we had used the term strictly as a Buddhist psychological term, as a terminal, uh, technical term. I have some difficulty because you laid down some mm -hmm. very clear markers at the beginning of the discourse. Yeah. When you said we're not, we're not going to talk about Buddhism and science and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. which limits our scope in terms of answering questions. 
Yeah, that's why. That's true. But the thing is, from time to time, when I clarify the term, then I have to explain where the term comes from. For the fact that uh, resistance is being used as a purely as a Buddhist psychological term, because there's resistance movements. Because in India, Gandhi has resistance movement, Ambedkar has resistance movement, and they, 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 those terms have a different meaning. When I taught resistance in, in Florida, they asked me the same, Ambedkar people have the same question. They took to them, resistance is a good term. So that Buddha had the same problem, right? Buddha chose, uh, once again, I have to refer to the Buddha. Buddha borrowed the same Hindu, Hindu terms, but he reinterpreted them. And he said, I use this term for this purpose. So that is due to the weakness of the language when, uh, when we talk about the third one. Uh, dogmatic view. Now, Buddha has never taught an ism. What is an ism? ISM, ism means dogma. He has never talked about dogmas. But uh, whereas, suppose, uh, in case you come forward and try to, suppose, okay, for example, you try to uh, uh, counter my Buddhist beliefs, or what I believe as a Buddhist, and in case I get uh, angry, I become defensive. What does that say? So, I am dogmatic. I am dogmatic. So, uh, if you if you defend if you are defensive, meaning you are dogmatic. Now. Uh, and then, uh, for example, when you come to say, okay, and tell me, I don't believe that there was someone called Buddha. I don't think there's nothing called Nirvana. I don't think there is something called enlightenment. Um, then I would simply say, if I am not dogmatic, I simply have to say, yeah, that is your belief. No problem. I have no problem with that. With that. Because now that you don't believe in what I do believe, uh, shouldn't be, uh, uh, shouldn't create any problems between you and me. If it does, then uh, the situation is dogmatic. So, uh, and this is uh, dogmatic view, and then you have to break it down into daily life. Dogmatic view. Um, so, in, in a family context, probably between husband and wife, two partners. So, in, in an applied sense, uh, when the two partners argue with the same thing and try to force each other's ideas upon each other so that there's no middle ground, and then your behavior is dogmatic because it is it involves a certain view. You want the other party to accept your view, but you are reluctant to accept the other party's view. That is dogmatic. Now, that invites troubles into a relationship. At times you argue with each other because you, because you, are, you can't stand the other, other party's ideas, opinions, decisions. And that is what Buddha called the, it's a fixation. And that can very easily destroy a relationship. And at the very beginning, because of um, your romantic, because of your um, attachment to each other, and you would say, let's say you come from two different backgrounds, right? and, then, and then you would say to each other, honey, when we make children, should we teach them your religion or my religion? Because as a family counsel, I know that most of the time parents bring religion into the discussion. At times, religion is uh, the source of the problem. And at the beginning, you know what? You don't have to think about that. Because uh, 
we are the lovers, we love each other so much, we shouldn't talk about that. If we, I don't think it's going to be a problem. But later, like 20 years later, you find yourself arguing with your partner about, about, uh, about the rel uh, religion of your children. At that point, what happens? Because at that point, now, uh, when you, then you, you become defensive of each other. When the romance slowly fades away, of course, according to Buddhism, uh, uh, Buddha has recommended uh, uh, romance. Later on, we will talk about that. We will have uh, 30 minutes or so in our future class to we'll talk about romance. Um, so, what happens to you is uh, you become uh, defensive because you are dogmatic. And you want uh, your children, but actually the children belong to both parents. So these are actual real life situations that people have, families to have talked about me. So you, you, you want uh, your children to practice whatever the religion that you believe in, that you adhere to, not the other party. At times, um, religion has paved the way for divorce in families. I noticed that. I have uh, lots of data. Maybe so far I have counseled thousands of families. At least 12% of them uh, decided to uh, file for divorce because of religion. So at that point you become dogmatic. So that's what Buddha means, dogmatic fixation. Third one. And uh, any other questions about dogmatic disease? Dogmatic in the sense of being defensive, so that you want others to accept your ideas, not necessarily in religious terms, not, not, in, not in spiritual practice, in your day-to-day -day life. We stick to our own views. So uh, we are uh, die-hard believers of certain views. When you are so much into something, you feel, okay, you are a diehard so-and-so, what? That's yeah. diehard. You can even sacrifice your own life to defend your views. And Buddha rejected that, dogmatic views. There were 62 dogmatic views, and Buddha wa never wanted his view to be the uh, 63rd. Not in Buddhist psychology class, one day we will talk about uh, them in another, another session. So, uh, <clears throat> any other questions about the third one? What time is it now? 7.55. So, yes. Uh, can you say something that you still have your views mm -hmm. on something, your opinion, right. but not be judgmental? Exactly. Not be judgmental, and you have to listen to the other party. It's, it's always sharing. <laughs> Actually, that's that's very practical question. Um, dogmatic <laughs> views held by someone could be used to, uh, could be in a positive way also, to have middle grounds for discussion. And then uh, while you stick to your own views, uh, you have to take some steps to listen to the other party. Actually that is, that is recommended uh, uh, in the sutras, in the teachings as well. Because Buddha was highly revered by lots of other non-Buddhist leaders, whenever he approached uh, different religious leaders and they were making noise and they were debating with each other. When Buddha approached, they became silent. And then Buddha asked, what were you talking about before? No, no, nothing, we were just talking. No, I would like to listen to. Simply because you want to listen to us, we never want to talk about that anymore. So that was the other party's answer. And that was, so that there was silence, positive energy being created. So, uh, as a couple, as a as a partners, as a family, uh, as co-workers, uh, it's always good to listen to the other party. Actually, if you are smart, as you say, uh, you can be smarter than the other your opponent. You have to make that speak, make that person speak, and you listen. 
y then you can uh, see where you stand and you can have the final say you never get trapped and that's a technique listening is a very good technique that helps to uh, deal with this uh, dogmatic behavior and number four is uh, speculation now uh, there are two kinds of doubts now uh, speculations are due to uh, actually that involves doubt uncertainty and uh, in Buddhist cycle there are two kinds of uh, doubts speculative doubt and investigative doubt speculative doubt and investigative doubt which one would like to choose investigative doubt and those who are judgmental uh, they go with uh, speculative doubt oh you know what I don't I don't do I do that's what you say I don't think so that's what you would defend always you try to counter if you really want to learn and you need to investigate doubts are a good source of wisdom but when you only go with uh, the investigative doubt not with the speculative doubt when you keep speculating you never you cannot make the clear conclusions whereas even though investigations are difficult and that helps you to uh, uh, clear your way of thinking because most of the time uh, when you have speculative doubt means you have subconsciously you have always subconsciously made some conclusions you are simply looking uh, reading you are simply listening to someone when you have speculative doubt and you are not ready to open up so this is also uh, we use uh, this as in family counseling as a family counselor I use this technique a lot how uh, so this is speculation now uh, uh, either party accuses that the other party is not faithful right not faithful and then uh, because I have come back to some families uh, they they live in the same house but they have no connection whatsoever no relationship and in one family in case uh, the husband had uh, uh, husband had been doubtful of his wife for like 21 years he failed to ask so I put them in two different I asked them to come over at two different times and spoke to them in, uh, in at two, two different sessions but later uh, I was the mediator and then, then he cried and said I, sh I should ask her sorry I tortured you so uh, and then so you need to investigate you start investigating investigation process by with the family with the friendly discussion right? so that is when uh, dialogue there's a whole psychology of dialogue and then in family life uh, you maintain your you keep up with your speculative doubt because you don't open up you don't uh, invite the other party for a dialogue you you stick to your monologue and you don't speak up you don't ask so that is why this uh, speculation that is you, you have to understand the speculative doubt in that sense because this is applied right? and we are the purpose of this disc discussion is not to attain nirvana <coughs> I would like to say right? this is not about nirvana this is about our daily life when you fix some problems in your daily life you are another step closer to salvation and then when you s remain the same typical person speculating and then defen being defensive and then dogmatic and all that how could you attain whatever the salvation that you want even if you visit the temple ten times a day you do lots of prayers but they won't help right? because you need to fix everything in here 
because salvation is the, as I said, salvation is the highest shift in our cognition. Cognition means, you know the words are there, uh, cognize and recognize. So the cognition. So we are cognitive. When it comes to cognitive behaviors in uh, Western psychology, they, they also use the cognitive, the term cognition, cognitive. Uh, so nirvana is the highest cognitive shift and it is within. So you don't have, it's not cosmic. You go nowhere. There's no going. You go nowhere. And uh, that's when, that's this uh, Zen question. Uh, what do you achieve as an enlightened person? Nothing. Um, you don't achieve, achieve anything. You achieve nothing. You seem to transform yourself, get rid of these fixations. So, uh, number five, conceit. Conceit, never to mistake conceit with uh, uh, pride. Pride has a positive connotation. You talk about personal pride, national pride, and you could be proud of your achievements. Pride involves achievements, uh, basically, uh, pride involves talents, achievements, anything, su uh, success and all that. Conceit means uh, it involves, it is a tendency of condemnation, belittling others, condemning others, looking down upon others. Conceit. So those who have this fixation, we all have, I also have, um, so conceit, uh, because of conceit, because of this fixation, uh, you happen to uh, look down upon others. Now, those who are down to earth, and you talk about the kind of people who are down to earth, probably you have been told many times by your friend, or maybe in your presence or in your absence, Oh, I like that person, he's so down to earth, she's so down to earth, even though she or he is highly educated and everything, because she could be very, uh, how to say, boastful about their backgrounds and education and all that, but no, they're very humble, very down to earth. But whereas when it comes to conceit, conceit has three levels, uh, superior, equal, inferior three levels. And then uh, in modern psychology you talk about uh, complexes. Right? Complex is uh, a chronic condition for which there's almost no medicine. So the, you talk about a uh, superiority complex, inferiority complex. And there's one middle. Usually in modern psychology you talk about two complexes, superiority and inferiority. And there's a middle one as well, when it comes to this, this fixation. Now, if you think that you are superior to everyone else, that's because of that fixation, conceit. Because um, whereas you can honestly talk about your achievements, your talents, at that point, you don't have conceit. You have pride. Pride is a good thing. So uh, you can be proud of your knowledge, proud of your background, but there's a fine line between being pride and being conceitful. There's a fine line between pride and conceit. What is that? Now, you honestly talk about your talents, achievements. <coughs> Why? Thereby you motivate people. You motivate, you motivate to motivate people so that they can use you as a role model. Whereas, where you cross the line is, uh, but you know what, I don't think you can achieve what I have achieved. In case you say that, that is not pride anymore. That is conceit. So, uh, that's a fine line. And then, uh, it's okay to it's ethical and it's okay to share your achievements, your, uh, your talents.
so that others can use uh, you as a role model. And at times, some people I have seen some people, and th that, that is superior. And then second one is uh, so, so the equality complex. Modern psychology doesn't talk about that. Modern psychology only talks about superiority complex and the inferiority complex. This equality never to be mistaken as uh, uh, the equality as a good quality. It's a divine principle according. So you try, you for sure, for sure in every aspect, uh, whatever the aspect that you choose to compare yourself with the other party, you are less lower. Uh, you are slightly lower uh, than the other party. And you try to equal yourself with that party. For example, let's say you just you bought a car uh, that was made in, um, let's say, 2017. And this is 2019. And it's the same car with a slight, the design is slightly different with the more options. And then so that, uh, so that uh, I come to you I and then uh, or you just uh, drive over to my place and say okay hey look at this this is my car oh it's the same brand it's the same thing I'm not going to know, use any brand names because this is going public uh, I never want to do marketing for them uh, so and then you would, then I would I would just say you know what while this yours is 2019 but mine is 2017 it doesn't make any difference you know what I know for sure all the, the car, uh, so it's uh, it's uh, how to say uh, it's more uh, crash resistant. Uh, all the, the car is more crash resistant, so that it can survive a crash. Whereas you know what, this is like cardboard. You know this is, and then but you know what, this is 2019. This this comes in more options. I d I don't need more those options. I simply drive to work and drive home back. That's it. Uh, and that is that is called equality and you try to bring that person down to your level or you try to elevate yourself to his level their level and that that drains your energy people that do that a lot it's quite spontaneous you do that that doesn't mean that you you are not supposed uh, to compare it's okay to talk about that but what matters is in case you feel uh, some, yeah, yeah, exactly, that's right, yeah. So, and then inferiority complex, the inferiority level of uh, uh, conceit, uh, and that, that one of superiority, equality, and inferiority, which one is more uh, harmful? Superiority, being superior, being inferior, feeling inferior, be, uh, feeling superior. Exactly. Feeling inferior. Why is that? When you feel superior, and you you live, uh, there's a greater distance between you and the other parties, other people that you compare. Whereas, um, when you feel inferior, and so that you feel marginalized, and so that you always you t talk about others too much because of uh, inferiority, because uh, you struggle more. Uh, when I talk to explain this to a young man in America this time, he said, yeah, the superior people have no game. <laughs> and I like that term, uh, his phrase. Whereas, it, it consumes, uh, it drains much less energy. I mean, when you feel superior to someone. Whereas, when you feel inferior to someone, it, it drains most energy. Because you need to struggle to prove that you are no different, and uh, and uh, so that uh, inferiority complex is more uh, harmful. So, uh, and let's say you are invited to a, a party, and then uh, it's uh, so you it, you work for the same company, and everyone else had the professional license to practice, whereas you 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 don't have. You are still studying for that, learning for that. And in case you, you know what, I'm not the, I'm the only one who doesn't hold the license. Everyone is really professional, I'm not. Should I go? Wait a minute, you were invited, right? 
because you are special. When you, you, when you attend the party, actually you remain special. Don't feel inferior, you are special. So uh, you must be able to hang around with anyone in the society if you are invited. And in, in the meeting, in the gathering, and some people are reluctant to go talk to the other part. Oh, you know what, he's a big person, I don't like to talk to him. But uh, your friend is, you know what, he looked at you and she looked at you and smiled. Did you see that? Did, didn't you notice? Yeah, but you know what, I don't feel like going and talking. Because you feel inferior. Don't do that. Because once again, as I said, this is applied, right? Applied uh, psychology. Now that is uh, conceit, number five. And number seven is, uh, sorry, number six is existential dissatisfaction. Sorry, a little big term. Existential means about our existence, our life, empirical. Dissatisfaction means we are not happy with the way we are in layman's terms. You all, your point of, more, in most cases, your point of reference is the past. I wanted to be like this, I wanted to be this, but I never happened to, I failed. So I don't like what I am right now, and I want to be like this in the future. So always, you, you uh, bridge the three timelines, um, the past, present, and the future, and then uh, what runs through is nothing but your dissatisfaction. You are not happy with what you are. Most of the time people, even the big achievers, for example, recently I came, came across one, one intellectual, you wouldn't believe that he has three doctorates in three subjects. And uh, he told me that uh, he wasn't happy with uh, the third doctorate he earned. He wanted to study a different subject. Then I said, why not? Most people wouldn't uh, earn uh, even one doctorate. You, you got three, why not try for the fourth one? Ah, then he smiled. But wait, then I told, wait a minute, sir, you have earned three doctorates. You say you are unhappy? Yeah, but you know, this is not the subject. Didn't you, didn't you feel halfway through research that this is not the research that you wanted to do? Well, at times I did, but I never wanted to give up. Then you didn't give up and you achieved, then go for the third one, fourth one. Oh, otherwise don't complain. <laughs> so that is why existential, of these fixations, number six is my more favorite, most favorite. Why? Because in daily life I always apply this one. I, I look, at, look into my selfhood and see where I stand. So I'm still a student. This time I just returned from my homeland, Sri Lanka, and people ask me, because you are still a student at this age? I said, yes, at this age I'm still a student. Right. So that uh, all your friends have become professors and intellectuals. Uh, then I said, you know what? Uh, I'm still a human being, as I wanted to be at least. Right. At least I could safeguard my humanity. Uh, so, let alone enlighten, enlightenment. So, uh, and that's how we are, because we always talk about our dissatisfaction. Are you happy with what you are right now? Of course, if I ask you, most of the people in the world would say that uh, they want, to, they want either to achieve more or want to, to be something else. For a reason, they ended up being something else. And this something else things continues. Right. So, and then, uh, so that is when, uh, at this point, because of existential dissatisfaction, people tend to maintain uh, another selfhood, a parallel selfhood. Parallel, that's called fantasy self. In Buddhist psychology, fantasy self. You pay a visit to that fantasy self, you be you become that for for a moment and come back. Right? You close your eyes and you keep flying. Uh, meet your dream partner that you have dreamt of all the time. It's not real life. And then come back and say, 
and then uh, so uh, you dream of um, you dreamt of uh, becoming something going somewhere and we always talk about something that is not part of our life I would always use food analogy right I offer you a lunch with uh, 20 dishes right and uh, so that I serve you the course meal and it will take few hours to serve you and let's say 20 dishes and then uh, most people would talk about the 20 21st one there should be another one when eating people most of the time talk about something that is not available at the moment and then, so they do that a lot and then when they talk about a person also when the husband talks about wife and vice versa uh, if you use this much of makeup and you would look much nicer more beautiful like that and always you are not happy with the way you look or with the, the way other party the others look because we always subcon we subconsciously maintain a certain standard for our lifestyle when we fail to have that in real life we go to that parallel self uh, we live in that parallel self like a fantasy self so it is it is in your mental mental world and then that's called uh, and then uh, it happens to uh, us a lot so that uh, now uh, so uh, prematurely children want to be adults prematurely right just as the girls um, um, so that uh, uh, still the mothers make up kit and put the makeup and the boys uh, in their father's absence the boy would uh, use the father's razor and shave there's nothing to shave and he just want to pretend to be an adult right? a girl want to be a lady uh, a boy want to be a man and whereas when you like uh, pass your teenage and then you become like 22 and you start pretending right? so that's why I would always talk about this aging because I do aging counseling as well because people want to rush into adulthood whereas when they adult when they reach middle age they want to slow down or maybe they need a u-turn come back right? and then you would say like uh, when you are 29 oh, I'm going to be 30 right? for the next five years you would be 29 And then when you turn 40, for the, and the gap widens, maybe 35, when you turn 49, and next day you turn 50, you would say, and then you, that, at that time, when you turn 50, most of them people don't ask, people don't voluntarily say how old they are. Instead, they would ask others, how old am I, can you say? <laughs> well, like you like 30 or oh, really did you say 30 thank you honey <laughs> so that's all indications of existential dissatisfaction because you never want to accept that even if at times you do accept but again when you are alone you try to uh, pretend and that's why you use different terms you ask uh, you ask people in the interrogative form you ask people to tell how old you look and so uh, and then if I say to a 99 year old person or oh, sir ma'am you look much younger for your age you are very handsome pretty thank you honey right? most of the time they tell me thank you honey why they, they, they feel lovely I mean they like my, they feel affectionate because I say that. But it's okay to say that. I always make people happy. Not to, not to deceive them. But I appreciate because honestly, uh, beauty is not age related. It has nothing to do with age. 
So in aging counseling, I use this technique. Uh, I talk about existential dissatisfaction. And uh, after middle age, when you are in middle age or when you are old age, uh, times uh, you would say, you know what, I can't, uh, I can't do things that I used to do like 50, 60 years ago. When you say that, you, ru you ru ruin the fond memories. Why? Everyone, uh, everyone came this far past youth. We all had youthful years. And then there were thousands of thousands of times that people called you handsome or pretty. And uh, you had that timeline. But right now, people wouldn't say that anymore. And then, uh, so that everyone would go to. Because I remember that when I turned 40 years ago, and you could have how many years ago? <laughs> one year, right? She said one year. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, and then uh, for the first time in Miami, somebody, because I, we were sharing the same uh, house, we call them roommates. But actually, we have our own rooms, individual rooms. And then uh, I was the oldest. And one young soon said, Bante, you are very old. And then, uh, so that, uh, and then I said, Thank you. But for the first time, somebody told me when I turned 40. They, they told me on my 40th birthday. Right? And that's when I thought about that. This is the first time somebody called me, I am too old. And so that, uh, and there was another girl who came to my rescue. And she said, yes, we are all much younger, so that's why he is old. I said, uh, don't try to soothe me. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to comfort me. I know I am 40 years old. Right, so, and that's how it is. So now anyone, sub that because of our subconsciously maintained dissatisfaction about our existence. People want, subconsciously we maintain that I am held, I am younger. I am younger, at least I want to be younger. That's one, especially you can t test yourself when you just before going to a party, a social event. How many times do you run to the mirror? And then poor mirror is responsible for your appearance. So that where makeups fail, you put the blame on the mirror. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Existential fixation takes you over uh, when you are on retirement. That's why now the psychologists say don't retire. Don't have a sense of retirement. And most retired people ma uh, voluntarily marginalize themselves. I'm retired. Then when, whenever they tell me that they are retired, I said, I don't think so. You could do more. And then that is one way to avoid that. So, uh, and then I know one professor in Canada. Uh, now uh, he is 92. He still teaches. 92 years old. In Canada, there's no retirement age for professors. They removed that years ago. Uh, so that, uh, so that uh, it is not that society condemns or calls you invalid. Actually, you yourself calls yourself invalid or uh, not. Uh, uh, how to say? Uh, uh, yeah. So you can work. Uh, it's it's up to you actually. Never to. At that point, I would like to say that uh, the romantic thing. I always say, uh, ba back in, uh, uh, sorry, but I have to just touch upon one Buddhist thing about that uh, insecurity you feel. One day we will have another lesson on insecurity. It's premature to talk about that, but this is relevant here. Now, uh, uh, people give up on, on their life when they retire. You are not supposed to do that. Because uh, 
you can still contribute and that's one way to avoid this uh, uh, fixation existential dissatisfaction now uh, the mature you become the older you become you are more valuable right in, in Buddhist psychology there are talk about different kinds of maturity age wise knowledge wise uh, even in terms of gray hair there's a value in Buddhist psychology he got gray hair means he's uh, suitable to advise others that's how you come across uh, that's uh, the definition of gray hair in Buddhist psychology so you are never too old uh, to serve to be happy right? so that is something about uh, existential disaster and number seven is ignorance now this is this is called a background fixation it's very difficult to define ignorance you can very easily identify trace define your anger like persistence you feel the heat you feel negative you feel whereas when it comes to ignorance and that is the last on the list now this is called the background fixation this is more like uh, the background to every other fixation it's like uh, in psychology it's called like a you use the dark room analogy now uh, so you are a visitor to a family and then unfortunately the, the day you arrive uh, they are without power no electricity <coughs> and then uh, so you have pro you, you reach that house uh, so in the late evening and then uh, the, your friend would say okay this is your room this is the key and there's a fridge there's a, uh, a bottle uh, there, there is wa water there is candle and then uh, so uh, and then there is this and that and uh, all the basic things are in the room right and so that uh, he goes to bed and you open the door it's too dark to uh, find the, the candle right so even though the room was full of all the facilities that you need for the night you don't see where they are you fail to see so it is so failure is on your side room fu full of all the facilities but you fail to identify uh, different objects in the room where the bed at times you hit against the chair and then you injure your toe right? and you almost uh, fell so uh, and finally you find the, uh, the lighter or the matches and you light the candle and then you light the room and then you begin to, you begin to see when the light the room gets brightened and you see the the fridge and the door as, uh, the chair and the bed and all the things but as long as you so that is when ignorance this the fixation of uh, ignorance and this has to be dealt with uh, uh, by the right company and mindfulness nowadays mindfulness like a mantra is everywhere right mm -hmm. uh, in the states I in Texas months ago I came across a girl who had just returned from a mindful eating class mm -hmm. <laughs> then I said wait a minute <coughs> I learned mindful eating from my mother and after that when I became a monk there's a dining uh, rules and ethics and then uh, say yes I learned uh, how to eat so my mother taught me and then also my monastery taught me how to eat because there are uh, rules and ethics and but uh, so it's mindfulness everything right? nowadays you have to be mindful now uh, mindfulness is the thing that you use to deal with uh, ignorance but I can point if this uh, if this is anger I can point to the anger and say this is anger this is resistance this is the conceit 
This is sensual passion, but it is very difficult to explain the ignorance. Why is that? The moment you make a decision, you feel you are making the right decision. Sometime later, you understand that you made the wrong decision. And you fall back to the same pattern. Why? And again, you are wrong. So that is when uh, you need the help of uh, a trustworthy friend who is ready to listen to you. You need a trustworthy friend. Always you need some good friends. And then uh, simply because, and then uh, so, the fixation of ignorance and uh, dogmatic view, they are friends. They are the worst combination. So ignorance and dogmatic views, they are the worst combination. So that uh, they are like twins. So uh, they attack you together. Right? When you have dogmatic view and you are not, uh, you, are, you are hesitant to ask others, ask others for their opinions, and at the same time you stick to your own decisions, and that is because of then uh, this fixation. Now, uh, when you are never ready to listen, and then even if you know that, I came back to one student, actually he was a friend of mine. I was studying religious studies, he studies English literature. And still he is doing his masters for the third year. What happened? He showed me that 21 assignments he wrote, it's the same assignment, he was asked to repeat. And always he started with the same opening line. And then he put the blame on the professor. And when, when he showed to me, then okay, you know what? Come over. See, he has crossed that out right at the beginning. You are not supposed to open, uh, that shouldn't be the opening sentence, but you, you have, you know what? No, this is, this is my thesis statement. I tried my best to convince my professor that I need to start with this one. Then I said, That's the, didn't your professor call you arrogant? Of course, yeah, that's what he calls me. <laughs> but you know that for sure. Yeah, but you know what, that I want to start like that. But if he uh, asks you 21 times to uh, correct it, not to uh, start your assignment like that, didn't you think even for a moment why he asked you to do that? No. He's into the fourth year of his master's program. And then I told him the last time, I told him, oh my friend, can you tell, can I tell you something? What? You will never graduate. Because he's my club. I could say anything to him. I told him, you will never graduate. Because why? Because of his arrogance. So, ignorance. Uh, the best indicator is that when people tell you to think about your decisions and if you get, uh, when you get, when you become arrogant and that is the indication that uh, that uh, the fixation of ignorance uh, has taken you over. So that's why, uh, so that is based on situations you can, life situations you, you can understand ignorance. That is the most subtle fixation, ignorance. So that is when, uh, when Buddha was asked what is the hardest negative fixation to understand? He said ignorance. <coughs> so it is throughout. So it runs through uh, all the other fixations. Ignorance. Remember that uh, when uh, when you read like religion books, bo books on Zen Buddhism, meditation, mindfulness, everywhere. And all the books, all the scholars, all meditators would say that there's one thing that they don't yet understand one one tendency of the mind that is ignorance it's very difficult to explain ignorance just like we can only use that dark room analogy the, the room is full of possibilities for the night but the thing is you can find them what if you light the candle so that you begin to see for that you need to uh, you need to inquire. 